uh, exams and be as accurate and fair uh, as we can be. OK, any questions as usual? Any questions about the material so far? Raise your hands. Ah, uh, yes. Good. What's your name? Angela. Angela. Uh, so I was wondering if there are ways to incorporate policy information about nodes that might not be conveyed in just their network position. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, so the question was, is there any way to incorporate qualitative information about the nodes? Actually, you can ask the same thing about the ties. Because so far, all I've done is I've just said, here's some nodes, here's some ties. But not every connection is the same. You might have five friends, but one best friend. Or you might have uh, five friends, and then you could grade them on how intimate those friendships are, for example. Uh, or you might have coworkers, and some of those coworkers might be really essential for your work, and others not so essential, et cetera, et cetera. Or you might have 100 people in your cell phone that you call, and some you call frequently, not frequently. So you can weight the ties. And in addition, the human beings have attributes, too. You know, some people are more or less educated, for example, or, or have other attributes that you could you know, grade. And there are ways to incorporate all of that uh, into both our conceptualization of what's happening and um, our mathematical analysis of what's happening. I only have so far given one trivial example of that, which I'll remind you of now, which is the Love Actually and Pulp Fiction example, where I talked about how it wasn't enough to know where the people were located. You also needed to know what kind of fan they were. Were they a Pulp Fiction fan or a Love Actually fan? So that'd be an example where you could map the network, but then in addition, you had to color the dots according to some of their attributes. And the obesity example would be another example now that I think about it, where you would know something about the individual and something about their structural location. That's a good question. Yeah, I forgot your name. Selan. What? Selan. Selan. Yeah. I don't think I knew it before, so I'm going to remember now. Yes, hello. For the evolutionary basis of social networks, can you, can we mathematically calculate the transitivity or like assortivity for infections and information and then see if that overlaps with the... So that's a really good question too. We believe that natural selection has been acting to shape the structure of human social networks. This is a claim that my lab is making. We really think it's true. It's not an uncontentious claim. We're trying to find it, adduce evidence for this claim. It is hard to imagine, based on friends, first principles, imagining all of the relevant factors that might have shaped it. So in a way, it's like we see what we see, and then we're trying to reason backwards as to what are some of the traits that might have shaped it. We do know that the structure of networks uh, that we live in seems to be optimized to maximize the returns on cooperation, seems to be optimized to minimize the flow of germs, seems to be optimized for social learning. There seems to be like a kind of balancing that's taken place for all of these different traits. But it's not, it, and it's possible to construct models that say, OK, well, if you had these four things that you were trying to do, what kind of networks would you get? But those wouldn't be exactly like what we have. And so then the question is, well, is that because that's an incomplete model? Are we neglecting some relevant parameter? Or is it because the theory is wrong? So it's, it's difficult to be certain about that. But it's not a coincidence in my judgment that networks have certain features that we're describing, as I've been trying to argue. And incidentally, if you're truly more deeply, raise your hands if you think I'm obsessed with networks. <laughs> yeah, I, I am obsessed. And uh, if you're truly interested, I mean, there's more stuff on you. I mean, we published a ton. Other people have published a ton. Uh, you know, you can read a lot more than even that I'm discussing in this, in this class. Did I answer your question? No. Yeah. Other questions? OK, so last time we discussed ways uh, that online and offline networks resemble each other and ways that they do not. We talked a little bit about how interpersonal influence might work online. And we reviewed some of the genetic antecedents and, to a lesser extent, the genetic consequences of social networks. And we talked about how an understanding of social networks helps bridge the gap between methodologic individualism and methodological holism, which is one of those like three or four big ideas that stretches across the whole class. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what one might actually do with this knowledge about networks to make the world better. So we spent the first 10 years trying to figure out the structure and function of social networks. And about five years ago, we began to ask, so what? What can you do with this knowledge to make the world better? If you really can understand network structure and function, how might you intervene in the world to optimize uh, the 
groups in a variety of ways. So I'm going to show you today some experiments that we and others have been doing to explore this set of ideas. So there are two broad ways you can imagine that you might ex uh, exploit these social processes. Two basic ways that you might alter a social network, which are known as connection uh, and contagion. And in a connection, you change the structure of the network. Okay? So you say, I'm going to rewire the network. I'm going to cut ties between people or introduce people to each other. I'm going to structurally modify the topology uh, of the network. And this is what Valenti in the reading for, and this is quite tricky actually to do, certainly with face-to-face -face networks. Not so hard with online networks, but imagine if I came to you and I had to say to you, you know, like if your parents came to you when you were a teenager, stop hanging out with so-and-so. You know, you're going to resist that. Or you two have to be friends with each other, and you know, you can resist that. It's not so easy in face-to-face -face networks to, for, to, to rewire the graph. Although there are applications of this kind, for example, in the military, when groups of 10 soldiers are put into a squad, they were previously strangers to each other, and as we discussed a couple of lectures ago, by manipulating the structure of interactions among these 10 men or women, you can elicit from them a property that typically wasn't present before, like a willingness to die for each other is a function of the kind of network graph that you might draw between these people. Or Alcoholics Anonymous would be an artificial network, or Weight Watchers, or other similar uh, examples. Uh, and online, as I said, it's possible to uh, implement connection interventions uh, fairly uh, frequently. And this is what Valenti, in your reading for today, refers to as alteration uh, of networks. Now to manipulate contagion, on the other hand, you accept the structure of the graph, and what you try to do instead is intervene in the graph to modify the kind of flows through the graph. How do behaviors or information or germs flow through the network? Like a vaccination campaign, for example. You say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not, quarantine would be a connection intervention. We're gonna isolate the infected people. Vaccination might be a contagion intervention. You're gonna vaccinate individuals to stop the flow of the pathogen uh, through the, uh, through the uh, uh, network. Um, and you might target people with information or behavioral interventions. Uh, and for example, like some of Tom Valenti's work on seatbelt use or substance use or smoking cessation, much of which was uh, in the readings uh, for today. And many people have been trying this, but we still don't have a complete understanding of why some things go viral and some do not. We still don't have a good understanding of what is it that maximizes the flow of certain things or why do some things seem to spread so easily and rapidly through a, a graft and other things do not. And manipulating contagion interventions includes various targeting procedures that Valenti describes in the reading, such as individual segmentation and induction, different kinds of strategies for manipulating a, a contagion. And this can be done again both online and offline. And this whole area is under very active investigation at the moment. And while it is quite clear that networks matter and that they can be exploited, Many aspects of this are still being worked out very actively by labs uh, around the world. And finally, as we're going to see towards the end of the lecture today, networks can be used not only to, uh, to, uh, to deliver information into the system or to manipulate the system, but they can also be used to extract information from the system in a kind of completely different turning it on its head approach, which I'll summarize with, uh, which is in one of the readings for today, which I'll summarize towards the end of the talk uh, uh, today. So let's review some of the uh, experiments, uh, some sorts of the experiments that will be required to really sort all this out. And here's an example taken from your readings uh, from a paper done by a former postdoc of mine, uh, Damon Santola. Now, it used to be thought that, um, that things spread very rapidly and easily, like germs, for example, in certain kinds of networks. And in this experiment here, individuals were recruited online and, uh, and were brought into this virtual laboratory and were dropped into networks with experimentally defined structures, okay? On the left is a random network, and there are 128 people here, and every single person here is connected to six other people, and every one of their friends is connected to six other people. On the right, the network has a different topology. There are 128 people here. Everyone is connected to six other people, and every one of their friends is connected to six other people. If I dropped you into one of these networks, you could not, for all intents and purposes, could not tell the difference of which of these networks you were in. How many people in your world? 128. You, 128. How many friends do you have? Six. You, six. How many friends do your friends have? They all have six. You, they all have six friends. You could not tell the difference 
between which of these two worlds you occupied. And yet the structure of the network of the world you inhabit might have everything to do not only with your own fate, but also with the broader performance of the group as a whole. Let's consider the example of an epidemic, for instance, a germ spreading. So this individual here, the dot color yellow, is connected to the six red dots. And this individual, the dot color yellow, is connected to these six red dots. Now I want you to think for a moment, if you infected the yellow dot with a germ, in which of these two networks do you think the germ would spread more rapidly and more completely? The network on the left, the random network, or the network on the right, the neighborhood network? Raise your hands if you think it's the random network. Now, germ spreading. Raise your hands if you think it's the neighborhood network. OK, so we have some differences of opinion about what will be spreading. It turns out that it's the random network, that the, that the germs or information will spread more rapidly in random networks than in neighborhood networks. And the intuition for that can be cultivated as follows. In the first time step, if you infect the yellow dot, he or she's going to infect the six red dots. And in the next time step, they're going to infect their connections and their connections, and psh, the whole thing will flush. Whereas here, it takes a long time for the infection to move all the way around to the other side of the network. And I can cultivate that intuition in you by asking you to consider the following hypothetical, the thought experiment. Say you take this connection here, and you cut it and this connection there, and you cut it, and you rewire it so that there's a shortcut across the middle of the network, preserving the degree distribution so everyone is still connected to precisely six people, but now with the shortcut. You should have the intuition that the germ now should spread more rapidly now that you've made that rewiring. It should cut across the middle and spread to the other side, and then the epidemic can now begin from two foci, from two original locations. And in the limit, you should be able to see that if you did that you know, hundreds of times, you'll convert this network to this network. And that's why this network, things like germs or information, spread more rapidly. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah, Leah. Is that because the red dots in the neighborhood network are connected to each other? Yes. <coughs> yes, that's exactly right. And so here, they're spread out, OK? Now, it used to be thought that everything spread better in uh, random networks. But it turns out that's not the case. Only things that spread by simple contagion spread better in random networks, OK? So imagine now the following idea. Imagine this is an online smoking cessation website. You recruit thousands of people. You're building an app of some kind to do something some of you might be doing. And you recruit all these people, and they come online. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them to quit smoking. And you persuade the yellow guy to quit smoking over here. And he has some weak effect on the six red guys to whom he's connected. But each of those red guys is surrounded by other people who are still smoking, all alone, <coughs> surrounded by smokers. So the epidemic of smoking cessation you're trying to start extinguishes and doesn't continue. Whereas over here, the six red guys are connected to these white guys that define a frontier who are connected to two, three, four, five, or six other people who just quit smoking. So things that spread by complex contagion, like smoking cessation, or cooperative behavior, or certain other sorts of things, spread better in neighborhood networks than in random networks. Okay? Now, the key intellectual point from this experiment, two key intellectual points, the first point is, is that your fate can depend on the structure of the network that you're in, even though you cannot control that structure, and even though you don't, uh, can't tell the difference. You can't know right now which kind of network you are in. And yet, it affects whether you're able to quit smoking, get a germ, cooperate with others, and so forth. First intellectual point. The second intellectual point is that the performance of the group, even though you have the same number of people and the same number of ties, some of these groups are better at, at germ spreading, and some of them are better at cooperation, for example. You see? So the property, the group can have properties that are not present within the individuals themselves. Another crucial idea that, again, speaks to one of the big themes uh, of the class. Now, we, along, we've been doing further experiments in this regard. So these are connection experiments. Okay? So these are, these are uh, arguments. So if you were trying to define, you, uh, you know, I, you give me 128 people, and you say to me, OK, well, how should we organize them? And I'll say, well, it depends on what you want to do. You want to do one thing, I'll organize them this way. You want to do another thing, I'll organize them another way. And you can online, or in person, perhaps, wire the network in a fashion that gives it desirable properties. So I can take you guys and by controlling your interactions, make you different. So you're the same human beings, but the group has different properties. Here's another example of that, an experiment that we recently uh, published. 
Uh, in this experiment, what we did is, is we created, uh, again, in our virtual laboratory, we recruit people from around the world using Amazon Mechanical Turk. And they come and they spend some time in our virtual lab, and we create little networks whose rules and other kinds of interactions we can experimentally control. So here in this network, here is a fixed network. Uh, and so the people arrive, and uh, the red dots are the defectors, and the blue dots are the cooperators. So people who are cooperative and nice are blue, people who are defecting and taking advantage of their friends and not cooperating are red. And in this fixed network, the network cannot change its structure across time. So you're dropped into this network, you're one of these people, and you're asked, do you want to cooperate with your neighbors or not? Do you want to contribute a little money to your neighbors and benefit them and pay a personal price? Of course, if everyone cooperates, everyone is better off. Or do you want to take advantage of your neighbors and hope they cooperate and you defect? That's your dilemma, OK? And what we find here is that across time, in a fixed network, as predicted by theory and previously shown by others as well, we reproduce the result that cooperation disappears from the system. Why does it do that? Why does cooperation disappear? Everyone at the end is a red defector. You have a little few blue guys here that are not coincidentally connected to each other and on the edge of the graph. Yeah, what's your name? Joel, yeah. Um, because just like the last slide, people are influenced um, by behavior, um, by like a bunch of people uh, in their position that okay. okay, so they're affected by others. So the cooperators are choosing to become defectors. Yes, other thoughts as to why? That's correct, but more. Yeah, Gianna? Um, there's no benefit to being a cooperator if other people are under defectors. Exactly. So what happens is, is you're stuck with these jerks who are taking advantage of you. And so every round you're like, I'm being nice, I'm being nice, and they're taking advantage of me. What do you do in the end? What would you do? Are you keeping a sucker? Raise your hands if you're keeping a sucker. Raise your hands if you say, the hell's out, I'm going to defect. Right? So most of you are human. Some of you might say you're saintly. I'll keep cooperating. But most of you would say, to hell with that, I'm going to switch to defection too. And so what happens is, by the end, people engage in behavioral reciprocity behavioral reciprocity, and they modify their behavior, and then they defect. And that's why in a fixed lattice, in a fixed, not lattice, in a fixed network, eventually cooperation disappears. Yeah, what's your name? Ike. Ike. Um, does it matter? So in, in round one, it looks like most people have more neighbors or have more connections to defect and cooperate. Does it matter if it's... No, they don't. They should, have expectation, they'll have no difference. This is a random assignment. Maybe this particular play... Yeah, I, I was, I was going to ask if it matters whether like, most people start out cooperating to that uh, in most of the, yeah, so I'll show you in a moment. In most of the, um, in most of the experiments, about 65% of people start cooperating in pretty much all of our runs. And then across replicates, sometimes the cooperators will, on app, will just by accident be assigned to more central places and sometimes peripheral, but in expectation, they're randomly distributed across all the experiments. And, and, and that doesn't have any impact on how it That is a really good question. I think we looked at that, and it's in the paper, but I don't remember. Actually, I want you to email me about that afterwards, because I'm going to try to hunt that now. I don't think there's past specificity according to where the individuals were at the beginning. There, there might be. I think about that. OK, now consider a different kind of regime, a different manipulation related to connection, where instead of dropping people into a fixed network, we add the additional thing that at every time step, you are able to rewire your network. So now, in addition to choosing whether to defect or cooperate, you can choose with some probability to cut ties to people or form ties to people you're not connected to. So now you can cut ties to defectors if you want or to cooperators, and you can form ties to cooperators or defectors. So now you can have an additional to, in addition to behavioral reciprocity, you can have tie reciprocity. And in this type of connection regime, when you manipulate connection in this fashion, in this world, cooperation persists in the system and defection does not go away. So giving people some control over their social connections is a way of optimizing and enhancing cooperation. And the big idea intellectual here is the following. I can take you guys, and by specifying one set of rules of social interaction, I can make you really nice to each other. Or by specifying a different set of rules of social interaction, I can make you mean jerks to each other. Same people, same human capital, different social capital, different collective properties conditional on the ties between individuals. Actually, in this experiment, we have four different, uh, four different treatments. Here on the y-axis is the percent of cooperative players. At the beginning, everyone's around 60%. And here's time, the round number. I just showed you the fixed network in green. It starts around 60%, and then it declines. And I compared that to what is called the fluid dynamic network, where about 30% of the ties were up for rewiring at any given time step. And in that situation, cooperation persists. 
We also had a couple of other experimental treatments was a random rewiring at each time step, so we rewired people at random, and dynamic, but this is dynamic, where there was some rewiring, but not enough, just a little bit of rewiring. It wasn't enough to sustain cooperation. And in a follow-on experiment, we explored the parameter space. We said, well, how much rewiring is enough, and is it linear or not? So here what we did is, is we looked at the rewiring rate from 0% to 100%, and here the estimated per round change in cooperation, the specific details are not important here, but the big idea is, uh, actually there, there's a sort of medium idea and a big idea. Let me tell you the medium idea first. Actually, let me tell you the big idea first. The big idea first is connection matters, right? The structure of the graph and the rules for engagement affect the properties of groups. The medium idea is the following. You get this parabolic shape here. So when there's low social fluidity, when you're stuck with these people, cooperation disappears. And when there's very high social fluidity, where at any given time step, everyone changes around you, cooperation disappears. And it's where you have in the middle, when there's some stability, some social stability, so you're kind of stuck with some people, but you still have some fluidity, that cooperation is optimized. And you can think about this from a social policy, policy regime. If you think about it, when you move into a neighborhood and all your neighbors are criminals, what do you do eventually? become a criminal, right? They're all violent and abusing you and stealing from you and so forth. Why would you continue to cooperate with them? Conversely, if you move into a neighborhood and you're stuck, they're all, no one's moving. Conversely, if you move into a neighborhood and every single day everybody changes in your neighborhood, they're always new people, you also don't make an investment in your neighborhood. It's when you have intermediate social stability that people take an interest in the commons is the idea here. Yeah, what's your name? Akil. Akil? Even at the median in, in the middle rewiring rates, Yes. On the y-axis, you still have a negative per round change in cooperation. Why is that? Why you still have a negative? Yeah, the slope, this is, this is across all rounds, so the slope is actually slightly negative. So actually technically what's happening here is cooperation is slowly declining in all of the treatments, except it's flat in the intermediate rewiring right here. So right around 70%, it stays flat. Is that what you're asking? never really increases. Never increases, that's right, above the baseline. So we can't, we don't yet, that's a very good point. So we don't yet have an intervention that we've been able, that's not exactly true, we have some interventions, but in these experiments that I presented to you so far, the best we can do is to stop defection from taking over. We can't foster cooperation in otherwise defecting uh, individuals. Um, okay, so those are two, some quick introductions, some quick ideas about manipulating connection. Let's talk now about manipulating uh, contagion. Because we can also imagine a set of ways that this might be possible, and I'd like to kind of walk you through this for a moment. So I'm going to illustrate this with some work we've been doing in the developing world. Uh, some students from this class last year helped with this project, and some students from this class this year are going to continue to help with ongoing work we're doing in this area. Imagine we're going to map um, networks in the developing world in villages. The same ideas could apply to hospitals or workplaces or classrooms or churches. Whenever you have units, social units. So you map the network of the village, dots are people, lines are social relationships, and you, know, you do so here. And imagine you pick six people at random and you target them for a public health intervention, like polio vaccination or clean water intervention. Now the conventional thinking about public health is you come back a year later and you see what fraction of the people to whom you gave the intervention responded to the intervention. So for example, of these six people, you come back sometime later, maybe three of the six responded, okay? And that's the usual way of approaching this problem. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in response to the treatment among the treated. I'm interested in response to the treatment among the untreated. What I want to know is what does everyone else in the village do when you target those six individuals. We should follow up all the other people who were not the target of our intervention to find evidence for contagion, social contagion within the village. So for example, imagine that three of these six people adopted the intervention and they influenced three of their friends to adopt. So a total of six people adopt over here. And by secular change in the control village, maybe two of, the six, two of these hundred people adopted. So six versus two is a pure measure of the spillover effect from our intervention. Is everyone with me so far? Then what we can do is we can start getting really inventive. Because instead of picking people at random, we can use network mathematics to try to identify who are the most structurally influential individuals so that we can target them. So here we might, let's say, pick 
so this is known as pure effects under control, or we're looking at the control village and measuring pure effects. This is pure effects under acceleration. So we pick, let's say, the six central individuals. If you were going to infect six people in this village with a pathogen, these might be the six you would infect to maximize the flow of the pathogen. Okay? So now you infect these six people with the informational or behavioral change intervention. Maybe three of those six again adopt, but now maybe they make 30 of their friends adopt. Same village, same intervention, same fraction of people targeted, 10 times potentially the impact by shrewdly picking strategically located individuals within the graph so as to maximize the contagion and the flow within the network. And you can again compare that uh, to the control village. Or by taking advantage of the thing that Leah was asking about, you can pick up on the idea of uh, complex contagion. You might say, maybe I should pick the six people who are already connected together to reinforce the adoption of the behavior. So you might pick a little zoom in and use network methods to identify a community or a cluster of individuals, target these six people, perhaps five of these six adopt, because they reinforce each other's behavior compared to three of these people. And then you can look at what other externalities, to what extent do they affect the untreated. So this is other, the untreated individuals. So this would be pure effects under group uh, treatment. But more experiments like this, both online and offline, will be needed to figure out how best to exploit networks for optimal behavior change. And in part, such experiments will be needed even to clarify what we even mean by a network effect. Because there are so many different kinds of network effects. Is it a network effect, for example, among the treated? Is it that when you treat individuals, the social reinforcement makes them obey? Or, for example, is it a network effect amongst the untreated? Is it the spillover effect this is what you mean when you talk about a network effect? So peer influence can be among those who are getting the intervention or between those who are getting it and those who are not, for example. But mapping a network is not always feasible. It can be expensive or impractical. And in any case, it's not scalable. Even if we invent all these beautiful ways of changing public health in the developing world, we don't have armies of people with computers we can send to villages to map them before we do something. That's very expensive and unlikely to happen. So the question is, how can we identify influential individuals without having to map the network ties for a whole population? Now, it turns out, as described in your readings, that it's a mathematical fact known as the friendship paradox that is summarized by the observation that your friends have more friends than you do. Did you know this? Your friends have more friends than you do. Your sexual partners have more sexual partners than you do too. And your co-authors, if you're a scientist, have more co-authors than you do. And the reason for this is as follows. Imagine that you consider now this network, and let's start by considering the limiting case, or the edge case. So you pick someone, I ask you to pick people at random, and you pick this person at random. This person has only one friend. That's why they're on the edge. And your friend has at least two friends. That's why they're not on the edge. So for this person, by definition, their friend must have more friends than they do. At least one more friend. And sometimes when you pick this guy, this guy has like eight other friends, has many more friends than they do. So you should have the intuition that at least for everyone on the periphery, their friends must have more friends than they do, in the limiting case. In fact, that happens throughout the network. Whenever you pick a dot and you pick one of their friends at random, their friends have more friends than they do. So the average person has the average number of friends. The average person has mu friends. But the average friend of an average person has mu plus the variance of the degree distribution, how spread out the degree distribution is, divided by mu friends. So your friends have more friends than you do. And I can cultivate this intuition in you as well by asking you to imagine that there's a popular party host that has a party that invites 100 of his or her friends, none of whom have any friends other than the party host. So now we have a room full of people, one party host who has 100 friends, and 100 people have one friend. And if we sample in that distribution and we ask people to name their friends, 100 people will name the party host, who in all cases has many more friends than they do. It's only when you pick the party host that you'll get a nomination of a person who has fewer friends than they do. So on average, your friends have more friends than you do. And in fact, it turns out that the friends of randomly chosen people have higher degree and are also more central and possibly capable of, of inducing greater spillover effects than the random people themselves. So it turns out that this is a really important idea 
because you can use this idea to identify central people without mapping the network. You pick people at random, and you have them nominate their friends, and the friends of the random people are going to be more central in the network than the random people themselves. And this actually allows you now to extract network information from graphs without having to map the whole graph. And we've been conducting field trials of all of the stuff that I've been presenting to you using public health and other interventions in various settings. So we've been doing work uh, in, in Honduras with vitamins and water purification and more recently with neonatal care. We've done work in Uganda with HIV treatment, in India with polio treatment and latrine adoption. Online, I just showed you a little bit of work on cooperation and information. We're also doing some experiments online right now where we're trying to foster rebellion. We're trying to create revolutions in silico to try to see where do revolutions come from and how do they arise. And we can also use some, and I'll show you, uh, physician networks where we can map physician networks and exploit our understanding of physician networks to foster the diffusion of innovation and practice change among doctors. Here's a quick snapshot of some of our work in the highland villages of Honduras. This is one of the regions where we work. It's a very poor part of the world. Something just changed for the better, uh, I think, uh, to spread out. Uh, it's a very poor part. I wonder why I did that. Uh, anyway, it's a very poor part of the world. People here live on less than $2 a day. And it's a coffee growing region. There are these little villages of about 100 to 800 people, an average of about two, three, 400 people in these villages. Uh, and it looks uh, just like that. And what we did is, is we mapped the networks of 32 villages in each of these uh, villages. And then we randomly assigned the villages to one of three different uh, treatments. So this third of the villages, we're going to pick 5% of the people at random. This third of the villages, we're going to pick 5% of people with the highest in degree, who are the most connected. And this third of the villages, we're going to use the friendship paradox. We're going to pick 5% of you, and then ask you to nominate a friend, and then we're going to go one degree removed from you and target those 5% of individuals. And we're going to have two different uh, public health interventions, a clean water intervention and a multivitamin uh, intervention. And the questions we're asking are, how do we move a whole village, and not just individuals, to change their behavior? And given a budget constraint, who do we target? Who should we reach if we really want to change behavior in this global health setting? Who, in fact, creates the most externalities for behavior change, and how can we exploit this? So here's a former undergraduate of mine. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, when I was still at Harvard. Uh, and she's in, we sent uh, Yaleys. I don't, I don't have pictures yet of the Yaleys, which I'm trying to dine you yet. Uh, we send them into the field, and she's out there uh, mapping the networks and delivering the public health uh, intervention. And here's how we, uh, and how we randomly assigned the villages. We did something known as block randomization, which I won't go into. But we matched the villages for their size and their wealth. And then we picked targets in each village independently for the, two, uh, for the two algorithms, for the two treatments. And so imagine, for example, that we picked this village. Uh, and in this village, the uh, yellow dots were targets for multivitamins. And the orange dots were targets uh, for chlorine, the clean water intervention. And it looks like the yellow dots were picked at random. They're spread out all over the network, and the orange dots were picked perhaps by the targeting of the, uh, for the uh, chlorine were picked by the algorithm that identified central individuals. Okay, so we have different ways of targeting the individuals uh, that we deliver in each of the uh, villages. And then here is one of my graduate students delivering the clean water intervention, the fluoride intervention. That's Alice Wong in the village. And here's some of our results. So here on the y, on the x-axis is the base of initial targeting, and on the x-axis is the proportion adopting multivitamins and the proportion adopting uh, chlorine. And what you can see here is, is that these three targeting algorithms, random, and degree, and nominated, didn't make a difference in chlorine. So when you target for the chlorine intervention, it doesn't matter how you pick them, at least among these three. There's no difference from control. 
But here, the nomination targeting is the most effective. So that if you start by targeting 5% of the population using nomination targeting, by the end you can have almost 75% of the people in the village adopting, which is significantly higher than the other targeting algorithms. Now we have many similar results, some of which are even more dramatic uh, than this. And the key intellectual point is that the targeting algorithm uh, matters. Now we have some ideas that we speculate as to why it matters for multivitamins but not for chlorine. And one of our ideas has to do with this complex <coughs> contagion idea, that the adoption of multivitamins is a much simpler kind of thing where it's an informational spread. You tell your friends, use the uh, chlorine, uh, uh, use the multivitamins. Whereas to adopt chlorine intervention requires multiple reinforcement, perhaps in social learning for many individuals in your network, rather than just a simple informational uh, cascade. And actually, you can visualize these cascades, these cascades and how they differ <coughs> like this. So for example, here's a village in which people, five people were picked at random. And here is time on the x-axis. And then they can, we, we measured this by having people give coupons to their friends that were then used to redeem the products of interest. So we could, to the day, track when the products were adopted by different individuals. And so here on the day one, this person gives a coupon to this person on day one, and on day three to this other person, and on day five to this person, and day three to this person. And then this person, once he received his coupons on day one, never gave them to anyone else. And this person, once he received them, gave them to someone else, two people on day nine, and didn't give them to anyone else uh, for the rest of the follow-up period. And here, this individual gave coupons to two people on day zero, and they never gave them to anyone else, and gave them to two and this person gave it to two other people on day three, this person who got it on day three never gave it to anyone else, and this person who got it on day three gave it to one other person on day seven, and so forth. The gist of what you can see here is, is that the cascades that are initiated by individuals who are now chosen in a different village by nomination targeting, here you see many fewer incomplete passes. Here you see many fewer gray lines than here, and visually you should be able to see that these yellow lines are much shorter than the orange lines. So, so nomination targeting accelerates the spread of the thing through the network and maximizes the number of cascades because you have fewer incomplete passes when you're picking these more structurally influential individuals. You can actually create movies that show this across time as well. This is a static depiction of uh, sets of cascades that are here being experimentally uh, induced. And so we can exploit ideas like this to enhance uh, to enhance the response to behavioral interventions, both amongst the untreated and amongst the treated. And in sometimes, and it, so the important thing to understand is, as I mentioned earlier about network effects, is that you can deliberately create spillovers from the treated to the untreated, or you can deliberately exploit peer reinforcement, maximizing the response to treatment among the treated. Two distinct ideas that you can use network theory to help guide when you're trying to change population behavior uh, at scale. And we estimate that you can quadruple the return on investment in some settings, and that taking into account network interventions could actually modify our cost effectiveness assessments. So right now, in public health and in medicine, when we try, we look at, for example, should I treat a woman for postpartum depression? Well, it costs $3,000 to treat her for postpartum depression. That's the cost of the medication and the psychotherapy. If you give her that treatment, what are some of the costs of that? Well, she might have side effects. You've got to add that to the cost. What are the benefits? Well, she's got a quality of life. She's no longer depressed. She returns to work so she can earn more money. Let's add all that up. And you look at the cost and the benefits, and you say, yeah, we spent $3,000. We get $30,000 in benefit. It's worth it. OK? But what if I told you that if you treat women for postpartum depression, they're more likely to vaccinate their children. You can save children's lives by treating mothers for their depression. Or what if I told you that if you replace an elderly man's hip, not only does his disability goes down, but his wife's disability goes down. All that benefit that accrues to the wife should be added to the benefit of the intervention. Now your cost effectiveness assessments of whether you should do engage in different sorts of public health interventions should radically shift because you have a social perspective a social network perspective now. If I persuade you to quit smoking, it doesn't just affect you, it benefits all these other people. And I really should factor that benefit in if I'm really going to do properly account for the whether or not I should implement different sorts of public policies. So that's another whole frame shift that occurs when you start taking people's embeddedness in social networks seriously. 
people are connected, and so their health and their behaviors are connected. Is that clear so far, the set of ideas and arguments that I'm making here? Any questions? And uh, what's the difference between validation and integrating in the experiment? Okay, so integrate is I is I go and I, I I map this network and I ask each of you to nominate who you know in this classroom, and then I tally up who has the most inbound nominations. You know, so she has ten people say she's her friend, and twelve people say you are their friend, and no one says I'm their friend. Okay, so you can you can map the network in that way. Nomination target is I pick some of you at random. And then I have you nominate your friends, and then at random I pick one of those friends using the friendship paradox, and then I target those individuals. So there are three, there's the random targeting, the in-degree targeting, and the friendship paradox nomination targeting that we use there. But there are other methods you could use as well. There are many, many different mathematical methods for picking a subset of the graph that you might target for the intervention. Andrew, is it the right? Uh, Matt. Matt. Ah. Yes, others, other questions? In the back? No? Okay. So, um, one thing that is common and interesting about social network phenomena is that they are nonlinear and they evince so called phase transition type behavior. Raise your hands if you've heard about phase transitions. Higher. Like, Come on, higher. Raise your hands if you've heard about phase transition. How many? I'm not going to call on you. I'm just going to count first, so you don't have to be too worried. Okay, so raise your hands if you've taken physics or chemistry. Oh, for God's sakes, you don't remember what phase transitions are? <laughs> Boy, you're educated. You've not been paying attention, okay? Okay, who would like to tell me what a phase transition Oh, my God. So 80% of you have taken physics or chemistry, but 10% of you can know, remember what a phase transition is. Who would like to explain what a phase transition is? Anyone? Yes, Ike. Not, are you Ike? Yes. Ike, yes. yes. Um, when you're moving from one state of matter to another state of matter. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> little light bulbs are going off. Oh. God. Pay attention, okay? So, um, so yeah, when you're moving from one state of matter to another state of matter. Now, what, who did those experiments when you were in high school for the love of God, and you had the, uh, the, the water, and you put the water in the, in the salt bath, or you made ice cream with your mom when you were a little kid, and you let the thermometer in it, and you cool the salt bath and you watch the water and it's getting colder and colder and colder and the water's getting colder. Is anything happening to the water? Hello? No. no nothing's happening. It's liquid. You're watching. And then what happens? All of a sudden, it freezes. It just suddenly, that's called a phase transition. What happens when you boil water? You boil the water, you put it on the pot and you measure the temperature. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Does it go to a thousand degrees? It goes from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 Celsius. 80, 90, 98, 99, 99.5, then what happens? It boils and it converts to a gas. So you don't get water that's 1,000 degrees in, at atmospheric temperature, okay? Because there's a phase transition. All of a sudden, it changes the state of nature. That's a nonlinearity in a physical system. Well, here's an example of a nonlinearity in a smooth, in a, uh, in a, um, in a, in a, in a uh, human system that shows that things do not always change smoothly. And this is from the Sasquatch Music Festival in 2009. Uh, so just watch this. <laughs> just joined him. They're strangers.
Rosario, right? Rosario, yeah. Um, at first there was only one person dancing, and it was very, very slow getting other people to start dancing. Um, Long time interval before the next person joined. But once there was a certain number of people, um, I think it reached like some sort of threshold, and then yeah. a lot of people started like coming around them and started doing them in. That's exactly right. This is, you saw virality or revolutions in action, okay? This random guy who's not a particularly good dancer is joined by a guy who's a slightly better dancer. <laughs> That's the crucial first thing, actually. Often, it's, often people focus on the first molecule to stop motion, but it's often the second molecule that's really important that sets up a nidus for the phase transition. And, uh, and then you get a third guy that joins with a shorter time interval. He's a slightly better dancer, the, the bigger guy that joined the third guy than the, than the, than the second guy. And then it starts to happen. And then around the 10th or 12th person to join is a different kind of person. What kind of person is that? Anyone notice? Yeah, what was your name? Victoria, Victoria yeah. Yeah. Then what happens? When a woman joins, so she, they're holding back, right? The women are probably 50-50. They're holding back for a variety of reasons. And uh, they don't want to be seen with these losers. <laughs> and then what happens when she joins? More, right? And then you get this cascade, and then it's like the whole thing freezes, okay? That's a phase transition, what you just saw. That's a social phase transition. And you can plot it with curves that were discovered about 100 years ago, actually discovered in the medical and social sciences. Mathematicians have been studying this for longer. These sigmoidal type curves, where here you have the percentage of people affected on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. So at the beginning, 0% of the population has the pathogen or has adopted the product, then you get the early adopters or the early effectors and you get the inflection point where you have the upstroke of the epidemic and you're skyrocketing and then you saturate the population. There's nobody left to kill or there's nobody left to adopt the product and so you get a flattening of the curve at the top. A classic S-shaped diffusion of innovation curve that you might uh, adopt. And as more people adopt a behavior or an idea or a product, it changes the feelings and the experience of other people. It changes the propensity of others to adopt. And this property, plus the finite size of the population, give rise to this classic S-shaped epidemic of, or diffusion of innovation curve. And initially, a small fraction of the population adopts. These are the early adopters. And then more and more do until at the peak of the epidemic, the percentage affected grows rapidly until the new plateau is reached. And there are fewer and fewer individuals that can still be uh, recruited. Eventually, all the water boils off. There's no water left. The party's over. So, more recent work that we have been doing has shown, taken advantage of some of these ideas, and shown that not only is it possible to deliver information into the system, the network system, but it's also possible to extract information uh, from the system. So let me show you how that might, uh, how might that take place. Remember last time we said that if you have a general network, you can imagine graphing the network, and you can imagine, you should have the intuition that if something starts stochastically, if there's a random start somewhere in the system, that it should be more likely to reach node C and more likely to reach node C quickly than node D. That C is in the middle of the network and that node C should be affected by whatever it is that's spreading sooner than node D, right? You have a, I hope all have that intuition that if a germ is spreading, it's better to be D than C because D is on the periphery, but C is going to be more likely uh, to get it. So if we wanted to monitor a population for something that was spreading, whether a germ or an idea, perhaps we would like to set up sensors on the most central individuals. So if we could identify central people in a network and follow them, perhaps using big data techniques, it would give us an opportunity to get an advance warning about an epidemic striking a population or about a new product that was about to be adopted. And actually, this would be better than picking what we currently do, which is six random nodes. So right now, when we want to track trends in our society, we try to pick people at random. That's good for tracking where the epidemic is today, but not as good if you want to predict where the epidemic will be uh, tomorrow. Why not take advantage of the structural knowledge of human populations to build a better mousetrap, to build a way of forecasting the course of things that are spreading by social contagion? So what this means is that central people should get infections earlier, and we should see that in the curves. 
So that, for example, if the red dot, if the red line is the curve I showed you earlier, which is the population adoption curve, here's the cumulative incidence of a contagion, and here's time, the curve should be shifted to the left among central people compared to the population average. And that actually, if you look now at the daily incidence of contagion, the epidemic should peak some amount of time delta T earlier in central people than in random people. So if we could identify central people and follow them, we would actually be able to forecast the course of an epidemic, getting advanced warning that an epidemic is about to strike the population. But mapping the network is not always feasible, as we discussed, and it can be expensive. So one of the ideas that we had was to actually use the friendship paradox. Pick people at random, have them nominate their friends, and then follow both the random people and their friends, and see if this could uh, work in some fashion. And we tested this idea with an outbreak of H1N1 flu amongst Harvard College students in 2009. <clears throat> so we went to Harvard College students, we picked some at random, we said, tell us who your friends are, and then we approached the friends, and we gave them all ice cream coupons at JP Lips. Uh, for every week they participated, they got like a little coupon, and we said, we're gonna send you a text message twice a week, and let us know if you have the flu. And if you say, yeah, and you just answer, yes, I have the flu, no, I don't have the flu, and if you have some symptoms, you could check off twice a week, you got this email, you responded, and every couple of weeks you gave me more ice cream. We actually caused an obesity epidemic at Harvard <laughs> while we were studying this, uh, studying this thing, and we bought thousands of dollars of ice cream from JP Lips. We were giving away these coupons. And, um, and then we also got the students' permission, with their permission, to link to their UHS records for respect to flu, so we could see whether or not they had the flu, did they show up uh, to get medical care. And, uh, and what we found was we predicted that this would be what happened. Remember, this was the prediction, and this is the actual outcome, exactly as we predicted. So the epidemic of flu peaked two weeks sooner in the friends of random people than in random people. And the whole curve was shifted to the left, just as predicted. And the two curves diverged about six weeks before the epidemic peaked. So the, the random population and the friendship subset diverged statistically six weeks before the epidemic struck the population. So we can use network methods to invent a whole new way to forecast epidemics. Six weeks advance notice about a, a deadly epidemic, it wasn't deadly H1N1 flu, but or of any epidemic is a huge amount of time uh, to do something. And it turns out we could map the Harvard network even though it was unnecessary for our main, uh, our main point. So we, were, we showed that the friendship paradox worked, it could be used, and it wasn't necessary to, do, to map the network, but we could actually map the network as long as we were there. And here's what is known as the largest connected subcomponent of the network. There's 700 people here uh, at every specific date. So what I'm going to show you now is flu spreading amongst college students day by day, because we knew to the day when they had their symptoms, across a four-month period, beginning September 1st of 2009. So the red dots are going to be cases of the flu, and the yellow dots are going to be friends of people uh, with the flu. So here we are, we're the 14th dot, the epidemic is beginning. And you can see it's, it's operates in little clusters in your body, it's spreading by contiguous spread through the network. Now we're at the epidemic growth phase in November, and now soon we're going to see fewer and fewer things lining up proportional to the individuals, and then it's going to you know, stop if the epidemic can follow us. So we can actually, this is very scarce, this kind of data, we can actually follow the spread of the epidemic through these individuals. This is the obverse of the thing that we did in Honduras, where we introduced the epidemic and we tried to follow the cascades. Remember I showed you the static cascade pictures. Now this is a movie, I could have shown you a movie of, of the informational cascade, but I didn't. This is a movie now of uh, germ spreading uh, in the population. And in fact, uh, even though it wasn't necessary to prove that the friendship paradox worked, we found some commonsensical prediction. This is days of early detection. If you look at the highest, the people with the most friends, they got infected 10 days earlier than the people with the fewest friends. Popular people get infection sooner. If you look at people with low transitivity, remember we talked about the mastodon, people with high transitivity and more insular networks, people who only stick to themselves and are among themselves, a dense group of friends, they're less likely to get infected with a germ, also less likely to get infected with new information. That's why you have the tea party. Everyone is talking to themselves, so they don't hear anything outside their own system. So, uh, so that's, what the, that's why the, they're in deep doo-doo in Indiana right now, because they just weren't realizing that they weren't talking to anyone other than themselves. To themselves, this seemed like a great idea. 
Uh, but now, actually, when there are other people in the system, uh, so that you could have predicted that from this. Uh, and given even high centrality individuals get the epidemic five days sooner uh, than, uh, than people who are low uh, centrality. And, uh, and how far in advance this, thing, this trick would work is going to depend on some other features which are not always going to be the same. So I don't want you to leave this lecture thinking, oh, if you monitor central people, you get two weeks or six weeks advance notice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying you will get some advance notice. And it will depend on what the thing is and all kinds of other features that I'm about to summarize. And you will only get advance notice for things that spread by social contagion. So would this thing work for syphilis? Raise your hands if you think it would work for syphilis. Do you think your sexual partners are more likely to get syphilis before you get syphilis? Raise your hands if you think your sexual partners are more likely to get syphilis before you get syphilis. Yes, that's the right answer. right? Because your sexual partners have more sexual partners than you do. Okay? So they're more likely to get it before you do. Okay? Now, uh, uh, where was I? I got off on the sidetrack because you guys, you guys didn't, I got that glazed look from you that, get, that makes me confused. Uh, <laughs> stay with me, damn it. Uh, <laughs> sexual partners, syphilis. Oh, different, uh, oh, right, thank you. Now, would this, so it'll work for syphilis. Now, what about malaria? Will it work for malaria? Why not? Yes. Yeah, malaria rains from the heavens on mosquitoes. It doesn't spread from person to person. So there's no social contagion with malaria, okay? So this only works, this forecasting thing only works for things that spread interpersonally, okay? It doesn't work for things that spread by broadcast mechanism. So news that you get from CNN that rains down on all of you equally, this doesn't work for. News that you get because your friends tell you, this works for, okay? So, and the amount of advance warning you get will depend on the intrinsic property of the thing that's spreading. It matters whether it's syphilis or information. Ascertainment of the infection, how, you've, how quickly you're able to ascertain it. The nature of the population, what kinds of people are they, Love Actually fans or Paul Fiction fans. The topology of the network, the structure of the graph is relevant to whether this thing works. In the limit, if nobody has any friends, or if there's no variance in the degree distribution, it doesn't work, okay? So you need variance. The more the variance in the degree distribution, the more this thing will work. And finally, it matters whether there's network deformation. So if you have something like Ebola, which burns the ties behind it as it moves through the system, it kills people as it moves through the system, that kind of a deformation by the pathogen will affect the probability of advance warning uh, in this type of situation. And as I've been suggesting, this method is not restricted just to germs, but to anything that spreads in populations by person-to-person -person means, uh, including a variety of uh, phenomena. So pathogens, information, norms, uh, and behaviors. And a key thing, as I've already highlighted, is that for this method to be useful, the thing in question must spread interpersonally, at least in part, and not just affect people independently via some kind of broadcast a mechanism. Now, we, since we did the study with Harvard students, with college students, we've repeated this on Twitter. And what we did on Twitter is, is we, using hundreds of millions of Twitter accounts, we picked 50,000 random Twitterers, and we went one step away from them to someone they follow to create a sample of 50,000 global sensors. And we monitored the global sensors and the random ones for 200 different hashtags. For example, light up Nigeria. And what we found is exactly what I showed you earlier. But light up Nigeria, this hashtag is shifted to the left in the follower, in the, in the, in the friends of the randoms, than in the randoms. And across 200 different hashtags, hashtags peak on average nine days earlier in people you follow than you. So basically, the people you follow are more likely to get syphilis than before you do, and are more likely to get hashtags uh, before you do. Okay. So that's the core idea uh, from the networks. And we can use data from phone companies, email providers, online networks, and other sources of information to generate network maps and track pertinent behaviors uh, and attitudes. And such data could also be used to identify friends of randomly chosen people and so forth. This is a, a network map from a, a data set of 8 million phone users in a European country, sort of NSA type data. We, didn't, we don't know who these people are. We obviously didn't listen to their phone calls, but the NSA is and does. 
Uh, and, uh, but we could map the network of these uh, individuals, and so now we can draw out for a whole society where are people located structurally uh, within a graph. And we can use people in, as sensors in all kinds of ways. We are, in my judgment, in the era of massive passive data collection. And we can harness huge amounts of naturally collected data, and new technologies can harness new technologies that track people uh, all the time. And this will allow us whole new ways of understanding social systems and social processes. Um, we can monitor traffic jams in real time using cell phone signals of people that are on highways. We can track doctors prescribing medications within networks to predict product adoption. We can track purchasing behaviors in personal networks to discern social influence on consumer choice. And there are all kinds of other ways that we can deploy these technologies to ascertain what's happening in populations and to intervene in them. And in fact, the availability of online and other data about human behavior heralds the onset of a new kind of computational social science that enhances our understanding of social processes and also facilitates intervention. Look, if you could have talked to social scientists like me 20 years ago or 30 years ago and asked them what powers they dreamed of having, they would have told you, you know what would be amazing? If we could have a little tiny Black Hawk helicopter and it could fly on top of you and monitor where you are and who you're talking to and what you're buying and what you're thinking. And if it could do that in real time for you and actually a whole city of people, that would be unbelievable. Of course, that's exactly the kind of world we live in now. You all have cell phones in your pocket that provide exactly that kind of vision into what human uh, behavior is all about. And the availability of data of this kind is exploding and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Internet data, social networks, websites, and links, telephony information, video cameras in cities, a new frontier. Uh, RFID devices, just today, Amazon uh, announced this little button, uh, the little Amazon Dash button. I, I hope it's not an April Fool's joke. Uh, where you can take a little tiny $10 device that you know, has Tide on it, and you stick it to your washing machine. And when you need Tide, you press the button, and it notifies Amazon to deliver Tide to your house. And you have a different button that's in your refrigerator that says milk. And you press that button, and it orders milk. So it just does one thing, this device. It orders the product that it's labeled uh, to do. These, is going to be, these RFID-type devices are going to completely change the world in the next 10 years. Administrative records, transaction records, geographic information, voluntary losses of anonymity. Your generation of people is weird when it comes to privacy. You have both higher and lower expectations, generally lower. You share all kinds of information that's widely available. And of course, personal genetics, a plethora of information that people are generating and that scientists are studying. And we're increasingly going to be in a situation to obtain passive surveillance of large populations in real time. But the question still remains, what are the big intellectual questions that such data might be put in the service of? And I think there's several such questions. In some ways, the deepest and most fundamental question I think we could use these data to address is the question of the origin of behaviors, values, and norms. Now, in most canonical economic thinking, People say, imagine you have agents, humans, who want stuff, who have tastes and desires, and they go out and they are trying to rationally maximize their utility by getting the things that they want. The behavioral economics critique of economics says, well, people aren't always rational. You know, they don't always do exactly what's best for themselves. Fine and dandy. But actually, there's, in my judgment, a deeper question, which is, where do those tastes and desires come from? I mean, why do you want what you want in the first place? Right? We can't just assume that, oh, you want stuff. Why? Why do you want these things and not other things? So I think that this type of science is going to help us get an understanding of that very fundamental question. I think we're going to be better able to understand the origin of social structure and collective action. And I think we're going to be better able to understand the super-individual institutional and structural constraints on individual uh, behavior. And I think more careful and more complete uh, Observations are great, but we have to ask in the service of what? Will this data collection, will this amount of data that we're collecting, in its breadth and detail, prove to be like the data that Tycho Brahe collected and that Kepler analyzed? And as I hope you all remember, Tycho Brahe was the Danish astronomer that collected all this information, and then Kepler comes along and figures out that actually the sun is in the center of the solar system and not the Earth. And, um, 
And the question is, will the data be useful like that, or will it be a distracting profusion of noise? And of course, Tycho was on to something. And in 1563, at the age of 17, he wrote the following. I've studied all available charts of the planets and stars, and none of them match the others. There are just as many measurements and methods as there are astronomers, and all of them disagree. What's needed, Tycho said, is a long-term project with the aim of mapping the heavens conducted from a single location over a period of several years. And I think that's sort of where we're at right now in the social sciences. I think we are actually at a point where we can have a kind of data that gives us whole new ways of understanding uh, very deep questions about human society and human interaction. And I think that with this science, we can understand how exactly the whole comes to be greater than the sum of its parts, and we can use these insights to make the world better. Any questions? Okay. Oh, yes, one question, and I'll let you go. Yeah. Uh, Who is that? I can't see. Brooks. Brooks. Um. <laughs> I should have guessed. <laughs> When you are, say, uh, writing a paper with colleagues, yes. how exactly, what's the, I mean, are you sitting around like, at a table, drinking coffee, talking about, like, what's the process of writing this paper with all of your peers? Well, we're certainly not smoking anything, I can assure you. <laughs> 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 we might be drinking coffee. Uh, uh, usually, I mean, different scientists do it different ways. Uh, in my case, uh, with my principal co-authors, if I'm working with my main co-author, James Fowler, we kind of take turns hashing stuff out. Sometimes he does it, sometimes I do it, sometimes I do some stuff, sometimes he does it. And by the end, it's very hard to tell who's done what. With graduate students, typically I ask the graduate student to rough out a first draft, and then I typically change all of it. Uh, <laughs> all right, see you guys next time.